All right. Looks like people are joining. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. So thank you, everybody, for joining us again for uh, another rendition of our webinar series. Um, as a reminder uh, to everybody, and, and for those of you who are new, um, the InsurTech program at Plug and Play is starting a weekly webinar series to kind of keep everybody up to date on some of the trends that are going. Um, particularly, you'll see a lot of information on kind of COVID response, and, uh, and particularly highlighting some of the startup companies that are um, pivoting or already have great products uh, in the market uh, to help us deal with these, these changing conditions today. Some of these companies you may have heard before, um, that's, that's kind of the beauty of the plug and play ecosystem. A lot of the solutions and technologies that have been showcased uh, in the programs over the last couple of years uh, have, are more relevant today than they ever have been. You know, an important element of innovation or investing or being an entrepreneur to build a, a product, you know, timing is unbelievably important. Um, it's one of the key factors of deciding when you're going to pilot, how you're going to pilot, you know, what's right for the customers. And that timing is always going to change, and there's always different factors that are going to influence that. Today, times are quite changed, uh, quite dramatically changed. You know, we're looking at very different types of customer needs. We're looking at very different types of solutions to, to reach those needs. And, and more importantly, you know, just the global business world is changing at a rate that we've never seen before. However, I think we're surprisingly well prepared for it. And I think we're gonna find that this is a real conduit uh, to create lasting positive impact with the technologies that we've been exploring for years now um, and, and truly believe in. So today we have a number of different topics that we're digging into, um, but we are focusing on the life and health side. One of the, the trends you'll see in, the, in this webinar series is every other week we'll be switching between PNC and life and health. Um, many of our partners do both. So we'd love to see you guys on a weekly basis. Um, there's also quite a bit of learning um, to be, you know, from the adjacent product lines and industries uh, that are be really important for us to extrapolate out and figure out how we can implement similar solutions for our customers. So today, um, we have a couple of wonderful speakers. We are digging into the life insurance value chain, and a number of the startup companies that will be presenting will be showcasing how they are implementing um, unique solutions along that value chain, and together, how we can kind of repicture what life insurance might look like, you know, five, 10 years from now. Um, to start us off, we have a wonderful fireside chat uh, with a good friend of mine named Robert McIsaac. Um, I am lucky to call Rob friend for about four years now. Uh, he was a very early mentor for me in the insurance industry as I was learning. And uh, quickly we've become uh, fast friends and, uh, and spent quite a bit of time brainstorming on what the future might look like. Um, sometimes complaining about the industry not moving as fast as we would like. And, uh, and, and, and really, I think few people have had as much influence on the digital transformation of the insurance industry as Robert McIntyre has. So uh, with that, Rob, I'd love to introduce you and uh, have, a little bit, uh, have you share a little bit of background on yourself and, and what Navarica does. Well, thanks, Hutch. It's great to be with you. And uh, greetings from Andover, Massachusetts, to all you out in California. Uh, great to be here. Obviously, we're living through very interesting times, which sort of taxes my ability to understate things. Uh, but I think it's also a fascinating time for our industry, insurance, and for people to be thinking about what the near-term future might look like and how it's going to be very different from what we've just come, uh, but nevertheless may be a reflection of some acceleration of things, as Hutch was describing. So a little bit of our background. Navarca is a technology research and advisory firm. We're focused exclusively on the insurance industry only in North America as an environment. So the regulatory world that we have in the US and Canada, very different from what we see in other parts of the world. And so that's why we've chosen to focus on that. And for us, insurance is all forms of life insurance, group life, voluntary benefits, work site, all the various forms of property and casualty insurance, wealth management, retail broker dealers. The only thing in insurance that we don't personally really focus a lot of attention on is Big H Health Insurance, as has been part of the US following healthcare reform 1990 style. Although oddly enough, I actually started in that business, so we do have uh, experiences that we can tap into there. We have 350 or so North American carriers that are part of a research council that we manage, which is a hub and spoke networking model. We keep all of the carrier participants uh, anonymized and uh, promise confidentiality on all the information we gather, but it provides us with an incredibly robust body of data that's reflected in the material that we publish into our research library. 
And we have about 130 carriers that have advisory agreements with us. And that's much like a retainer fee with a law firm where effectively we become part of their team from a strategy standpoint. We just, we like to say historically, we don't happen to be in their home office environment unless they ask us to be. Technically that's still true, although right now everything is virtualized. And as you can probably imagine, uh, many of our carrier clients are leveraging us even more than they typically do, uh, which in some ways is a very silver lining for us that's coming out of, uh, of what is clearly a very challenging and difficult and unprecedented time personally and for the industry. Just my background, I've been at Navarica for about eight years now. I've got responsibility for, I like to say, everything that isn't PNC, that actually falls into my world. Uh, but as my background illustrates, it's pretty broad. I've spent more than 30 years in industry before joining Navarica, typically in senior leadership roles in the technology world. Uh, so I ran the original e-business development group and the innovation center at Prudential Insurance for one, at one point, for instance. I worked in group insurance, uh, voluntary benefits there. I worked on the uh, uh, investment side, uh, went over to Guardian Insurance later, was the divisional CIO responsible for all their retail investment businesses, uh, was the enterprise CIO at a worksite and voluntary benefits company called Pencorp Financial, also was the uh, enterprise CIO for First Citizens Bank, which was a top 50 bank, still is a top 50 bank, but I was there during the financial crisis, uh, which as you can probably imagine, led to some very interesting things. We were a healthy bank during that period. Um, so we did nine acquisitions in 18 months. That taught me an awful lot about the FDIC and the Treasury Department, uh, we worked very closely with. And then I wrapped up in terms of working in insurance companies by running the business transformation office at Nationwide Insurance in Columbus, Ohio. So I actually have more than a little bit of experience in the PNC world as well. And I got every one of these gray hairs, as Hutch has heard me say, the honest way, the hard way. So great to be with you today. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, I, I probably started getting grays the day after I met you. Uh, but I think that's part of the, uh, part of the earned uh, stripes of, uh, of the insure tech space as it is. Yeah, good news is it's not contagious. <laughs> well, so... You, you have obviously a pretty large background, particularly on the technical side. Um, obviously, uh, through the Navarica Research Organization, you guys have a unique perspective across what's happening on many carriers, um, kind of coming to you with unique problem statements. And so I just kind of, cur you know, curious, my quick pulse check, you know, how is the industry responding? You know, did you think that they were well prepared for this type of scenario? Um, even from a technical standpoint, you know, you were kind of responsible for putting a lot of these systems in and kind of creating that future capability to, to handle these types of things. How has the general response been over the last few weeks uh, in your in your ecosystem? Yeah, so, you know, it's an interesting question. Of course, there isn't a singular answer to it, but I think that the answer has been, at least in terms of being able to survive the original work from home mandate all of a sudden, the industry has actually done surprisingly well. I think some of the carriers we've talked to have actually been surprised themselves at how well they did with it. Uh, many of them had business continuity plans in place and disaster recovery plans that have been developed in anticipation of certain things. And having built a lot of these plans and actually executed a number of them, um, as I'm fond of saying, I don't live my life under a dark cloud, but I was in New York on 9-11. Uh, we had to escape the city while buildings were falling down around us. That was not something we had practiced for. But the business continuity plans that we had built and practiced gave us the mental shelf space to focus on things that were new and different because the basics we got down pretty well. And I would say most carriers have done a pretty good job of getting up and running with people working from home. Um, so that's a good thing. I think that uh, the other elements that start to come from that are that some have been pleasantly surprised that plans that were really set up to allow people to work from home from two or three days have now allowed them to work for home for a much longer period of time and may well have to be there for a much longer period of time. And so those organizations, I think, are going back and revisiting with some of the things that were foundational assumptions in the work from home strategy. So for instance, uh, VPN capabilities were pretty important. VDI capabilities were pretty important. Did they have sufficient bandwidth for that? And in many cases, the answer was no. And so they had to go back and fix some of that. Uh, the idea of VDI or visual desktop uh, technology is great until the desktop you're visualize, virtualizing has a problem. So they've realized that now they have to periodically send people back into the building to reboot machines. Um, 
one of the dirty little tricks about VPNs we've also discovered is that in order to patch them, you have to actually reboot them periodically. And this is a time when security is a bigger issue. So organizations are having to come up with game plans for how they're going to adjust that. So it's, those are straightforward things. I would say that another aspect of it is that this has exposed companies that had not fully digitized many processes to things that they had really not thought through, right? So they digitized part of the new business process. So they digitized part of the customer service experience. But one of the things that actually happens is the periodically paper gets printed out and somebody has to go fetch that. Sometimes that paper is in the form of a check. So somebody needs to go check that out, pun intended, pretty quickly. Those become the kinds of things that highlight where there are new problems that may well need to be addressed in the not terribly distant future. I think there are also some happy stories in that, right? So one of the things that we see is it's a very uneven experience in terms of where carriers are right now. One carrier that I talked to began a digitization journey six years ago with a data strategy. They digitized a lot of things that allow them to do things like accelerated underwriting, electronic applications, electronic signatures, electronic delivery, but they had never ratcheted things up and say you have to use these things. So in that particular carrier's case, they were running along at about a 30% adoption in February. By March, they were running along at a 90% adoption. Last week, I got a note from the CIO saying we're at 100% and we are never going back. And they set three record sales weeks for life insurance for all time for them in three successive weeks. They've said their home office staff is actually more productive working from home than they were when they were working in the office. And they've actually constrained new business sales because they're not wanting to outrun their capital base. Well, that's a pretty happy story. I have actually talked to another carrier who shared something very similar, but that's not a universal story. So I think one of the things that's highlighted here is that we may have a world of haves and have nots on some of these things. It redefines some of the competitive universe and so it's going to be very important for people who already have those capabilities to not let up, keep their foot on the accelerator. And for those who are playing catch up right now to frame a strategy or a game plan that's going to allow them to do that. Because the one thing we know for certain is we are never going back to February of 2020. Whatever new normal we face in the future, it's not that. And I think that's really key as people think about digital capabilities right now. Absolutely. So that's actually an interesting concept. So we had a very different strategy in 2019. Um, when we were looking at 2018, you and I had a lot of talk about this. It was, it was very clearly PNC focused, right? We were, we were, a lot of our clients are coming in saying, you know, we're, we're, the disruption is coming from the auto industry. It's coming from these kind of traditional product lines. Um, I think you and I felt pretty differently. 2019, we really saw the life insurance industry engage. We saw a lot more digital technologies being involved. We saw more startup companies keep receiving funding. Um, it was working you know, kind of in this, in this network of plug and play where we saw the life insurance side really start bolstering up and we were excited to see that, that, that learning transfer. Um, obviously this has changed a lot again. However, a lot of the technologies, even some of the ones we're seeing today, you know, have been in our programs for years. And a lot of these technologies um, are just as relevant today as they were two years ago when we first started looking at them, although the priorities may have shifted. Um, so curious from your perspective, you know, what were some of the big kind of uh, product differentiation initiatives that were kind of being pushed in 2018, 2019 in the life insurance industry? And do you think that, you know, we're just accelerating the time on those processes or do you think it's actually changed uh, in light of new, new events? Well, so it's a great question. I actually think it's both of those things, right? And I'll, I'll unpack it a little bit. I think that, uh, and I've, I've said this to a number of people, I think what we are likely to see in the life insurance world is that in the next three or four or five months, a decade's worth of digitization and virtualization take place. Uh, because I think there is so, both a recognition suddenly that it is the art of the possible, it is a competitive positioning because others are already doing it. And because in some cases, companies have already identified the fact that the things that they thought of as being impossible to do back in February turned out to totally be possible as long as you were willing to blow up or blow past some of the things that were internal constraints. So it's a simple example, but one of the things that we heard from a number of our uh, life carrier companies was that 
they knew that they needed to get more video capabilities and virtual capabilities in place for their home office environments, and that extends out to the field. They had plans that were gonna take them nine or 12 months to roll out things like Microsoft Teams or some other uh, video-based capability. Turns out you didn't really need nine or 10 months. It turns out you could do it in two weeks if you had a reason. And it turns out now they've had a reason. And we hear from these companies that their business partners come back and say, you know, the IT guys suddenly are heroes because they were able to do some of this. So I think that's, that's an example of sort of reframing how people think about this. On the other hand, you know, technologies that we've talked about, you and I have talked about out at Plug and Play and some of the startups that we've talked with, the idea of getting away from how we've done life underwriting for the past 35 years is really important. And I'm old enough, some of these hairs have been around long enough that I was part of the teams that helped to implement the paramed-based, fluid-based underwriting. Many people don't even know why we do that, but that was a consequence of the AIDS epidemic in the mid-1980s. And we suddenly woke up one day and realized we had no idea what we were underwriting. You had no idea where you were going. It's like driving along on an, on an interstate highway at full throttle and then somebody suddenly shut the lights off. So we had to find a new way to do it. And that was the way. Well, it turns out that way doesn't really play in a world where you can't go visit people. My suspicion is the last thing in the world that anybody wants is a paramed to show up to, to draw fluids. And in point of fact, we already knew that people who were the younger half of the Gen X generation and millennials had no interest in that anyway, which is I've somewhat tongue in cheek said the life insurance industry has really never figured out how to sell anything to anybody born after 1975. And if, if you don't believe it, just look at the Limer data, right? So now we knew that that group would not do those things. And in fact, in many cases where they did have life insurance needs, then they do have those needs. They were quiv uh, pivoting to uh, voluntary benefits, worksite capabilities, group insurance, where you kind of had a different paradigm for how the insurance played out. So now, suddenly forced into a world where paramedics don't seem to be part of the future anytime soon, and good luck getting an APS right now, thinking about different data sources, thinking about data enrichment, thinking about how to do things differently, which is exactly what this other carrier that I described is doing, right? So they built these capabilities out and they were exercising them lightly. They just went from a quarter throttle to full throttle essentially overnight. I think that's an example of the kind of thing companies need to think through quickly. I also think that this is an example where waiting and thinking too much actually puts people at risk, right? Because finding the resources you may need for that will become increasingly difficult as you get further into the spring and summer months. You know, Hutch, you and I were laughing about this, but you know, at Navarica, one of the things that we, as a company, were virtualized anyway, but we decided early on we needed to get a collection of webcams to send to senior team members of, of my team and myself. We didn't get enough webcams. We figured, well, we will we'll sort of go half throttle on that. We'll come back and get the other ones later. By the time we wanted to get the rest of them, the delivery times were like eight weeks. So this is an example in the world of vendors, the vet world of data, where acceleration may be pretty important, as I've shared with a number of carriers, if you wait too long, the decision may be made for you. You may not be able to do anything. And that's a really bad position to be in. You know, anyone uh, who's, who's good at this is always, you know, you pick your metaphor, get better cards in your hand, more arrows in your quiver. You got to do something to get ready for that competitive space on the front end. Then you get to other things that people may have been either not thinking so much about or have somewhat downplayed, right? And that's the post-issue servicing transactions. And one of the things that we've talked a lot about at Novarica is there's a very clear pattern if you look in financial services broadly where technology adoption happens first in retail banking, highest uh, transaction volumes, lowest switching costs, complete transparency. Wait five years, those things migrate into the insurance world, always personalized property and casualty insurance. Again, high transaction volumes, low switching costs, complete transparency. Wait five more years and those things migrate into the life insurance and related lines world. So as a consumer, I, I was watching this. My banks, both of them, immediately were sending me relevant information, updates on their mobile capabilities. They changed business rules to make my life easier. My auto insurance companies, similar things, 
slightly slower cadence, right? Lower transaction volume, so it fits perfectly with the pattern I would have expected. My life insurance company, I got a lovely email message that had been ghostwritten by the CEO along with a phone number. And that was the last time I heard from them. That doesn't work in this world and it's really stark how it stands in contrast. So I think what many life insurance carriers are gonna find is that getting back and figuring out how to digitize some of that post issue service capability is gonna be really important. That's gonna focus on allowing people to do things on their own. Oddly enough, self-service is the best service. It's also the cheapest service to deliver. I think it's gonna tell people a lot about transactions that people are willing to do, which over time helps to perfect uh, the internal data. And I think data strategies are absolutely critical to this. That's one of the things we talk a lot about is that digital strategies are fantastic, but if they have bad data underneath them, they're bad strategies because they'll create a very unhappy experience. So you have to do those things hand in glove. And I think the carriers are going to find that that allows them to do a lot of things that they might have wanted to do anyway, like next best offers and a better understanding of consumers. You know, when I was in the banking world, we used to lament at the start all the regulatory things about know your customer, which is a, a, a banking series of regulations that came from the last, um, uh, last recession. But as we looked at that, it realized the know your customer requirements actually meant that we oddly enough had to know our customers well enough to be able to also suggest other things that might be valuable and added for them. And I think this may represent a bit of a pivot point for life insurance companies where they may well have to get after that. And they also need to get after what they're doing with their agents, right? Because this is a world where the, as the products get more complex, it's an advised relationship. The insurance commissioner from Oregon uh, asked, asked me a while back what I thought the future state of the insurance uh, agent world would be. And my reaction to that was at some point, and I, in my mental model, it was 2025, 20, 2027, as you look at the demographic patterns, the average age of a life insurance agent in the US today is 60. What you're gonna see in, at some point in the future, far fewer agents, they're gonna be equipped with way better technology to handle much bigger books of business and they're gonna provide a lot more advice. Um, and I would have again said that, you know, I think 2027 is a really good time to think about that. I actually think now based on what we're seeing that maybe 2022 is a really good time to be thinking about that. It's gonna collapse that time frame. And I think for companies that don't get after that, they're gonna find themselves in a non-competitive position, even dealing with their producer community. And one last thought on that, Hutch, before we get to the next question. We did a group uh, event, not unlike this, uh, for agents in the under 40 category. It's uh, something that we're very interested in because of their drive for digitization. And one of the agents we talked to said, you know, the only reason I have to go into the office is to get all the paper that the, ca the carrier sent to me. I got to print it out, take pictures of it, and send it to my clients. Well, that's not a great experience. That's a very fixable thing. Um, and I think it illustrates sort of getting after some of those backend processes and understanding them a whole lot better. Absolutely. That was awesome. Um, so I know we're running a little bit short on time at this point, and I could talk to you all day like we have in the past. Um, but uh, just on a quick kind of wrap up, I'd love to kind of, you know, just get one kind of final point in. Um, Obviously, the product of life insurance is changing. There's, you know, talking about the front end and talking about the back end. Um, but just on an exciting kind of note, you know, you know, in, in a future life insurance product, you know, what is a feature or, or, or a, a service that you, you know, are particularly excited about or you see being uh, a real differentiator in, in the next couple of years? You know, product development is always a fascinating thing. I think one of the realities is that flexibility and fungibility becomes really important. One of the analogies that I would draw, you know, and, and I think this is reflective of how I thought about things as a parent. Uh, when our kids were born uh, back in the 80s, uh, one of the things we used life insurance for was a savings vehicle. Because when you think about way back in the dark ages of the 80s, some of the things we take for granted today, like the ability to have brokerage accounts, trade all the time, that just didn't exist. I mean, when I bought stock for the first time, they actually sent me the shares of stock, um, which created a different problem around where am I gonna put them? Um, 
And then all of a sudden the world changes through a series of technology advances. And one of the advances led to 529 plans and the ability to, I'll just pile the money in and I'll have some smart person on the backside allocate that out and effectively line things up so that uh, the, the, the assets are focused on when they need to mature because I have a very specific life event that's coming. And we see those same kinds of things happening now in terms of retirement plans. Well, why not have insurance products that adjust and adapt as people go through different life stages? Why not have annuity contracts that effective or life insurance contracts that can effectively become annuity contracts or pension plans at some point in the future? So you save for one thing, but as you pass another life milestone, it automatically changes into something else. Uh, obviously, there are a bunch of technical issues that go with that, undoubtedly some compliance issues. But I think getting outside of the world of it's a singular product that does something forever into a world where it's much more flexible uh, to meet different life needs is going to be really key, Hutch. So I know we're at time. It's been great to be with you. Uh, I'll send you some material that you can uh, send uh, along to the audience participants. But uh, again, really appreciate the time to be with you today. How can the people find you? Oh, uh, so they can uh, look us up at Navarica.com. My email address is my first initial last name. So it's R-M-C-I-S-A-A-C at Novarica.com. Or they can call you and you can send the information along. That is absolutely true. We will be definitely connecting people up after this and uh, and, and sharing some of the recordings. Uh, but Rob, honestly, I, I, I I learned so much every time we chat. You've been such an, a huge mentor and, and uh, an asset to me personally and, and to the team at Plug and Play. So, so thank you again for everything. My total pleasure. Thanks a lot, Hutch. Have a great afternoon, everyone. All right. Thanks, Rob. Okay. Fascinating discussion. And I, and I really encourage people to reach out to Rob. Um, I think a lot of our partners actually might already know him. Um, you know, he's been to our events and, you know, his groups come through with Plug and Play pretty frequently. Um, but definitely, definitely a, a fascinating conversation every time, and, and I encourage you uh, to hunt him down. Okay, so with that, we are going to transfer into the startup portion of our day. Um, we've had a quite uh, exciting conversation on the types of tools and the technologies that uh, are going to be, you know, really leveraged into the future of life insurance. Um, but now we're going to take a shot at actually seeing it, actually hearing from the entrepreneurs themselves, um, and, and really looking at, you know, how can we implement and scale this uh, to create a more meaningful experience in the life insurance industry. As a quick housekeeping update, uh, we did have one company that had a last minute uh, complication. Um, so Verikai will no longer be presenting. Um, however, uh, they are good friends of ours and we're, and we're happy to uh, kind of share that contact information and introduce you over to Hari uh, if you're interested in learning more. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel, our rock star on the startup ecosystem side, and uh, we'll transition to the startup companies. Thanks so much, Hutch. And thank you, Robert. All right, well, welcome back, everybody. Um, excited to kick off the startup portion of our presentation today. Um, some quick guidelines just to wrap up. Um, if you didn't join us last week, um, please remain muted until you are presenting. Um, remember that our startups do have Q&A portions uh, timed into their presentations. And if you want to submit questions, use the Q&A bar at the bottom of your screen here and we can answer those live. Um, the chat feature for general comments and questions um, and the poll that will pop up um, is a two minute warning to our startups that their uh, time is, is running out, um, but it's also contact, uh, contacting information if you want to connect with that startup. So we'll be sure to, after the presentation, send out um, the recording and connect you accordingly. So without any further ado, we'll bring in our first startup. We have Navark. are you online? Nemo? Oh, yeah. Welcome. Thank you very much. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. I am Emil, I'm the CEO of Novoic, um, and I am a computational neuroscientist by training from Oxford University. I want to kick off the presentation today by showing you two different sentences. One of these are from an Alzheimer's patient the other one is from someone who's healthy. I just ask you, can you tell which one? Here's two different voice recordings. One is from someone with depression. The other one is from someone who's healthy. Can you tell which one? So we can. It turns out that there's 
patterns in the words people say and the way they say them that change when the brain gets affected by a particular um, brain condition or when the respiratory system gets affected by a respiratory conditions. And we can actually use these patterns to go in and look at um, symptoms of neurological diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's or depression or respiratory diseases such as COVID-19. Now what we're working on in the work is to make objective assessment of health as easy as having a conversation. We only use a short voice recording that's the basis of the technology. We founded by Oxford and Cambridge researchers and what we're doing in the company is accelerating decades of research in how speech changes and disease with breakthrough natural language processing and deep audio analysis. I want to take a step back and talk about why this matters. Now we think there's a very big opportunity today for digital technologies and smart aging um, for what's going to be the next generation of insurance, of life insurance companies. I just want to flag up a couple of the points that are on the slide here. One is how the aging population is creating a bigger pressure on payers. We're seeing an increased utilization of big data and AI by insurance. And really early detection and differential diagnosis will play a key role in future uh, in, in insurance models and, and products. And we think that a neuroscience platform based on structured, clinically validated data sets would be a key value driver for insurance um, facing an aging population. Until today, we haven't had a scalable technology for accessing, say, cognitive health. Whether it is imaging, whether it is in-clinic visits, these tests are impractical and they're often very expensive to conduct. I think we can all agree with the current pandemic and the current situation that has really highlighted the need for solutions that are remote and that are scalable and also ideally cheap to administer. And speech is one such technology. The reason we think it's the best platform for doing remote assessments of, of health is that it's the core way that humans exchange information. So whether you speak with your doctor or if you speak with your insurance carrier, you do the, that through speech, you do it through, through human interactions. I'm talking right now to convey information. It's also the way that we input into digital devices, either text or speech. Now we know from the literature that it's also the best validated digital biomarkers across a variety of different diseases, including Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, ALS, and beyond. And we are finally getting the technology we need to extract and assess these patterns in a way that is generalizable and robust. What we do is we use the most novel deep audio analysis and natural language processing to extract expressive patterns of speech and language, so patterns of how people, people speak. You could think of this as like, like, a, um, like a speech fingerprint. And we then tie them in with clinical outcomes in controlled studies. We have a product suite that's ready for integration into your healthcare platform. This includes API stacks for processing speech and language, extracting disease relevant um, features, um, we have a biomarker discovery platform that builds on this uh, with work from our, um, our world-class team um, in deep audio analysis and natural language processing and mobile applications for both in-clinic and remote self-assessment. And we're flexible in terms of deployment and integration. I want to end up with just showing you how powerful this approach can be. So what I'm showing on this slide is two of our biomarker candidates for, um, for cognitive health specifically that are based on language. So you see one on this axis and the other one on the other axis. The individual dots here on the, on the figure are individual people that either have or don't have um, cognitive decline due to Alzheimer's pathology. And you see based on just these two markers how we can nicely separate out the populations. We've applied these particular markers in people going all the way back into their 50s. Another example is based on voice. So these are two of our vocal um, voice biomarkers that we use here to differentiate with, between people who are feeling normal and people who are feeling high negative effects. So they're feeling very down. And you see again, a very clear separation between the two different groups. This is one of those technologies that will be completely obvious in 10 years. If you want to work with it today, come and have a conversation with us. Thanks. Thanks so much, Emil. So a few questions while we have some time here. Um, how do you measure accuracy and what are your results? So we, 
what we what we generally do is we we test out the vocal markers in controlled clinical studies and we tie them in with clinical outcome measures. So that can be a, um, a score on a cognitive assessment, CDR for for Alzheimer's, or it could be underlying biomarkers in a particular condition. We validate using um, so accuracy measures are sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, um, using sort of gold standard statistical methodology. I hope that answers the question. Great, thanks so much. Uh, and one more here while we have a little bit of time. Um, this has mm -hmm. powerful applications for the insurance industry. What are the HIPAA requirements? Yes, so I will prefer to follow up on that question offline. If you reach out, we have done all of our business folks today in, in Europe, and I want to make sure that we have the right people for my team dealing with this. Um, with this particular inquiry. Great. Thanks so much for your time, Emil. Thanks. Awesome. All right. Next up, we have Philip with Kit. Are you on, Phil? Hey, how's it going? I'm on. Great. How uh, are you? Take it away. Okay, great. So just give me one second while I figure this out. Can you guys see that? Looks good. Great. Hi guys, uh, my name is uh, Philip Fung, and today I'm, I'd like to introduce to you KIT, the at-home test for life insurance. Excuse me. So over the past few years, life insurance has gotten dramatically more convenient for customers. Buying has moved online, the approval process has been streamlined, but one part of the life insurance buying process that hasn't changed for decades is the medical exam. The medical exam still requires a human to either come to your home or customer to go to a clinic to get blood drawn. This requires scheduling, one-to-one -one interaction, and causes about a 30 to 50% drop-off rate in your insurance buying process. In addition, the current health crisis with COVID has made things even worse. Even though life applications have gone up, phlebotomy and one-to-one -one human action has become increasingly restricted and regulated. And, th and this is a huge, this has prevented many applications from being underwritten. Uh, a, a solution that's frequently talked about uh, when addressing this issue is around quote unquote fluid list technologies, i.e. using historical prescription and health record data in lieu of the medical exam to gauge health risk. But even with this technology, even today, 90% of life applications still require a medical exam because this data is key to underwriting. We believe the future of life insurance goes down a very different path and that solution is KIT. KIT is very much like Amazon for medical exams. A box is delivered to a customer's home and allows the customer to do a full self-test medical exam, including blood testing, drug testing, smoking, weight, blood pressure, and the customer sends back the contents to the lab for processing. It's better for the customer because it's one, safer. All the interaction is done uh, without one-to-one -one interaction. It's more convenient. It can be done at any time without scheduling or taking time off. And in general, it's just a much more modern experience that brings life insurance buying process up with current times. We've designed a very beautiful customer experience to, to make this a delightful experience for customers. We use a combination of the latest state-of-the-art lab diagnostics combined with an intuitive and easy to use packaging and smartphone technology that guides the user through the process and also prevents fraud to give a modern and familiar experience that your customers will love. KIT is a complete one-to-one -one replacement for the life insurance exam, meaning we do all the major tests that insurer needs to underwrite, including blood panels for the heart, liver, diabetes, kidney, to blood pressure, and even weight. So this allows an underwriter to use their existing tried and true actuary models with our KIT. Test processing is at the heart of KIT's DNA. We spent the last two years developing and staffing a CLIA laboratory from scratch, and that's where I'm sitting right now in our, in our laboratory. Our lab has the highest certifications possible and, we have, and we're equivalent to a hospital laboratory. We've developed new technologies to make over the mail blood testing possible and stable and can currently process hundreds of samples a day and pro probably thousands in the coming months as we expand. One of the big concerns with using an at-home kit for life exams is fraud. A patient has motivation to seem healthier than they are and can submit a fake sample or substitute another person to take the test. We've created a robust, patented solution to combat fraud. 
Using a smartphone, we guide a user through the entire process and record their interactions and ID to verify the user's identity and use a variety of tempered techniques to ensure a chain of process even when the smartphone is off. All this information is freely available via API for the insurer to review as well. Our team is made up of world-class leadership in different fields of science, software engineering, and medicine. For example, I'm one of the first engineers at Facebook. I built many of their early mobile apps. My parents were lab techs in hospitals, and my father-in-law is a farmer's agent. Uh, my colleagues include a former health commissioner of Baltimore, a lab scientists who run the labs at UCF Seth Benioff Hospital, and people who have deep experience with logistics to make this a smooth process for insurers. So that's a little bit about KIT, the at-home health test for life insurance. We're currently uh, looking at partnerships and we'll we'd like, be delighted to speak to you if you'd like to learn more. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. A few questions here while we have some time. Um, a lot of questions around fraud um, and ensuring that the individual that you're testing is correct. Can you speak a little bit more to that? I know you touched on it. Yeah, so we spent actually a lot of time uh, on this particular issue. Obviously, this is uh, uh, something that's dear in mind with a lot of insurers. So um, we have a patented process with a smartphone. So basically, when you first open the box, the first thing you take out is a smartphone stand. And you put your smartphone on the stand and you download uh, this application that allows us to do basically like a guided video type conference with you. And that conference allows us to one, verify that you are who you say you are using a variety of techniques and looking at your ID and things like that and comparing it to the video on screen. We also make sure that you're doing all your interactions on screen and uh, collecting your sample and uh, using all our devices. And so a lot of this is really around, we're substituting a one-to-one -one interaction with a smartphone. And so that's a lot of the technique we're using. And then all this information again uh, is uh, uh, available for the insurer to review um, afterwards as well. So in many cases, um, this is even superior to having a, a phlebotomist in that you can actually review yourself um, all, the, all the collection. Great. And have you seen um, life insurance carriers considering home kit testing data at this time? Yes, I get calls literally every day. Um, we're working as, as quickly as possible to get things up and going. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll be live in about a month from now. Uh, but yes, lots of interest. Um, uh, I know this is a very new technology uh, for this industry, but uh, this has been something I'm, I've been passionate about for 15, 20 years. Uh, how do we make home kit testing possible and make it easier for, for people to do blood testing without having to go to a phlebotomist? And I think we have, we've done something that's pretty good and we'd love to um, kind of talk to any uh, life insurer that's interested in, in, in pilot, piloting this process. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Philip. We'll be sure to connect you. There are some follow-up questions. Um, be sure to connect you directly to those folks. Thanks so much. Awesome. Please let us know if you'd like to connect with uh, Philip and Kit. Um, in the meantime, though, I want to bring on Surefire. You online, Dustin? I, I am. Can you hear oh, me? I'm back. I'm hearing you well. Uh, it says I can't start my video because the host has stopped it. <laughs> Hmm. Let's see on our end. Can we? There we go. We see you now. Uh, you you don't see my face, but uh, I don't think. Um, but I do see that my screen is up. Um, it's just saying I cannot start my video. Okay, we're in business. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Dustin Yoder, uh, the CEO here at Surify, based in uh, just 15 minutes from plug and play. Um, however, uh, we have clients in eight states, so we run around. Um, to start off, uh, Surify is a team of 90 these days. We've surely, uh, we were the first insured tech investment by plug and play, um, and uh, about four years ago, and so, uh, we're, we're excited to have grown out of what we see as the, uh, the startup phase and, and live with um, 10 plus customers today. So uh, what you're going to see and be get an overview of is um, the products that are live and um, how we're helping uh, insurers today. Um, we have three of the top 10 in the U.S. as well as uh, 
you know, down to very small insurers. We can work with the whole, the whole gamut. Um, I'm here to talk about three core problems today. Uh, number one, life insurers are struggling to sell digitally in an omnichannel capacity. This has obviously been showcased uh, lately with COVID. Uh, life insurers have little to zero digital interaction with their enforced policies post-issue. And life insurers are not enabling enforced customers to efficiently and, and more, more, most importantly, effectively and digitally service their policies after uh, they buy. So if you really sum it up, we actually find that most insurers' capabilities look like the following. Uh, yes, that is a white screen. Um, and, and that's what we're here uh, today to, to discuss. How are we making this so that an insurer uh, can solve that? Um, we have built the Lifetime platform. Lifetime Acquire is to enable omni-channel uh, product sales through direct-to-consumer agents call centers. Lifetime Engage is to engage that customer post-issue. And Lifetime Service is to enable uh, web and mobile policyholder servicing. Um, so I'm going to rapidly go through uh, my, my job today to get you interested. Uh, we'd love to show you full demos, each product, you know, over an hour demo. So Lifetime Acquire. Lifetime Acquire is about an end-to-end -end application process to take you from typically a form um, given by an agent and then manual underwriting to where we actually launch your uh, D2C uh, or uh, full digital uh, agent application integrated with accelerated underwriting. Um, that starts, for example, with a quote. We integrate with your products. Uh, we we AP enable to your quoting system uh, to part A of ap applications. Um, like I said, integrated with accelerated underwriting and third-party services to your part B, um, enabling uh, that true accelerated underwriting where we integrate with Hanover Re, uh, Swiss Re, um, RGAs, Magnum, um, MRAS, et cetera. Um, and finally, get to that e-sign uh, or click to sign um, to where that person can have a full e-delivery e and, and new business uh, transaction take place. Um, if they don't, and we know in the market that sub 50% will go through accelerated underwriting from what we see or here on the market, uh, we have OnTrack, which is basically the Domino's Pizza Tracker to guide them through that, the, the, the process, but all digitally. Lifetime Engage is our, sec our second module in, in the Lifetime platform, uh, basically creating a list of engagement uh, capabilities for life events, uh, challenges, uh, educational content, quizzes, polls, rewards, wearable integration, uh, product store pushes, health wellness, financial wellness, uh, all built for the life and annuity companies. So whether that's uh, time relevant uh, pushes, whether for something like COVID, <laughs> um, which is pretty timely, I guess, all the way to life event pushes based on your integration through our system with Facebook, um, we are looking to engage that customer where they're at, all the way to static, more like not, they, can, they have learning centers on your products or your solutions um, that can be both quizzes, polls, video, I mean, videos, educational content, et cetera. Um, where we came out to the market and has been quite successful is our, um, our health and, um, you know, our health uh, tracking um, with IoT connection to bring in new types of data for the insurer. Um, and that doesn't just include uh, your strictly uh, Apple Watches, et cetera. It's the whole gamut. Um, and, and then we bring that full circle around to where you can engage on something like health challenges all the way to like financial challenges and checklists. We see an intersection of both health and and finance um, is where most life and annuity companies are. Um, we use engagement videos um, to educate those customers, market to them, et cetera, um, all either controlled by our program management team or the insurer. Um, we've been learning a lot through uh, polls and quizzes from those direct connections with those insurers. There was insurids, um, and then streaming that back to create personas in our system. Ultimately, we found that customers with lifetime engages have stated they're five times more likely to purchase another product with the same carrier. So really securing that digital relationship. Um, lastly, we have lifetime service, which was drawn for the fact that if you're engaging or selling, uh, but then you're going back to a, a faxing, uh, it's just not that uh, beneficial of a relationship and ultimately costing a lot of money in um, FTEs and call centers, as well as uh, labor uh, cost for the scanning and you name it. So in our customer self-service platform, we offer Android, iOS, and web applications. Everything in our platform is fully white labeled to drive, um, whether that's the viewing of the application, beneficiary change, 
um, putting everything in one place, um, lapse notifications to, to drive up persistency, in which we see, we saw, you know, 300% increase in lapse responses with our system, um, all the way to, you know, one in the morning, changing your beneficiary or getting that yearly reminder to make sure everything's up to date. Um, and all this all comes full circle in our carrier panel, which streams in this information um, on all the data of each customer. Um, uh, your, it allows you to configure the platform, manage the content, access controls, and a full uh, list of integration partners that stream into the system. Um, so you're getting that 360 view of those policyholders to then drive tagging, persona analysis, and engagement. Um, you're able to configure and set up. Once again, we find that insurers like to use our program management team in the beginning as they don't have these teams always set up. Um, and then uh, we help and the insurer, anybody in the insurer can have access to the analytics and insights uh, gained through the platform. Um, this is a full stack platform uh, hosted on AWS, uh, but set up in individual instances to keep all data separate. And as we mentioned, white label. Thank you for your time. Any, I'm not sure if I have time for questions, but hopefully that was a good overview. Awesome presentation, Dustin. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but happy to connect anybody with uh, additional cues to you and the team uh, directly. Please let us know via the poll if you do want to connect with Dustin. Thanks again. Thank you. Awesome. And last but not least, we have Carl with um, Elegy. Are you online? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, hearing you well. Welcome back. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, thanks for having me. I'm coming, coming to you from my uh, kitchen in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, hope everybody's well. Uh, Elegy is a digital distribution platform for life and health insurance. And we're focused on, uh, if you're a carrier, uh, partnering with you in your distribution partners, um, primarily BGAs and IMOs, uh, but also affinity groups and brands uh, that are interested in, in selling life insurance, selling your, your products to uh, to, to their customers. Uh, so uh, enabling distribution. We have both a direct to consumer uh, platform that allows a consumer to go all the way through the underwriting process uh, through a quoting, approval, bind and, uh, and put in force with a credit card. And we have access uh, and capabilities for a lot of the accelerated underwriting products that use third party data in that process. But also we have um, more than two dozen traditional products on our platform and we've digitized those application processes in many uh, ways. And then we have a LG agent cloud, which agents can sit on that, our platform and connect in real time with a consumer that's shopping online and going through the process. So the reason why we started LG uh, almost five years ago was the fact that, um, you know, insurance consumer expectations are not being met. And that's still true to today. They, they look for things that they're looking for when they shop elsewhere outside of the insurance space, which they find uh, uh, often, which are the quick process, accurate quotes, product choice. They expect you to use third-party data about them to make decisions. Uh, and they wanna be able to talk to an agent when they choose to talk to an agent and, and not talk to an agent when they just wanna shop on their own and obviously have transparent pricing and features. I'll just highlight two case studies here that use uh, either our technology or similar technologies. Um, first is, uh, many of you might know about the Assurance IQ acquisition by Prudential. Um, and Assurance IQ has very similar technology to ours in terms of distribution, but their business model is different. Uh, direct to consumer where we're, we're an agent, uh, agent facing uh, technology platform and really what they did in a matter of a few years was was put uh, lots and lots of agents and lots and lots of customers on their platform in a very simple model that drove customers online uh, to phone agents and you know what their what prudential's uh, position to do is bring that to all of their career agents and expand their their model uh, at elegy we uh, started with AccuQuote, which is a large direct marketer of life insurance, uh, mostly term life and final expense. And they utilized the LG platform 
uh, to, to really change their, the game around their return on lead investment, more than two times ROI there. And they reduced their uh, technology costs at the same time by almost half. Uh, and I would uh, point out that in the uh, current environment, they move from on-site agents uh, to off-site agents in a matter of 24 to 48 hours because their agents were already on our platform and it was easy to transition off. And uh, that's, that's, I think, where we're headed in the industry is to be able to do um, agent distribution remotely. So we're positioned to provide, we're positioned to grow by providing really four digital solutions to IMOs and BGAs and others that are uh, looking to um, utilize these emerging digital tools. We're partnering with a small number of carriers and integrating with them closely uh, so that agents again, whether they be individual agents, BGAs, or IMOs can, can then utilize those technology integrations seamlessly. The four areas are to uh, market and sell to the Enforce customer base. Uh, second, to provide a turnkey digital distribution model similar to Assurance, what Assurance has done to a large number of traditional distribution uh, channels. And then enable automated case management uh, and allow agents to submit digital applications through, through our software. So what we do in, in the Enforce customer base is we analyze the list of customers and then provide targeted digital marketing uh, campaigns to each of them and, and drive them to an on, on, uh, a, a, a online platform to uh, fill out an application and then send them to an agent when necessary. The turnkey get digital business model allows uh, you to put digital marketing dollars and agents on a turnkey platform that drives new customers and allows them to send them to your agents. Then uh, automated case management, we essentially take the work away from case managers and put focus them on the the most, uh, the most important situations in the process. And then digital application submissions, we allow uh, to agents to, to utilize our digital tools to submit, a, submit uh, digital applications. I'm just gonna, in the last few minutes, show you uh, this in, in real life. Uh, if you can see my, uh, my screen, um, uh, essentially this is the, the online uh, direct-to-consumer platform that, that allows a customer to go through uh, and, and answer the underwriting questions. Uh, we're, we're fully um, compliant in terms of TCPA uh, permission. We get the, the customer's uh, permission to call and we can, we can integrate with our dialing technology right into an agent and take a digital application. Uh, we can, as I said, get uh, quote, find and, and payment online. Uh, I'm going to just switch to the agent side, which is, uh, uh, and I'll just let that run while we, we, if we have any more time for questions. But that uh, is, shows you what the agencies sees during the process when an agent gets a call uh, in and starts taking the application during the process. We recognize the consumer and go through the underwriting process. Thanks for your time. Thanks so much, Carl. Okay, so please let us know if you'd like to connect with Carl and the team. Um, in the meantime, I um, want to turn it back over to Hutch soon, but thank you so much to um, our presenters today, and, and thanks all of you for tuning in. We hope that you'll join us next week, same time. Hutch? Awesome. Thank you so much, Rachel. Huge thank you to everybody on the startup side who presented, um, as well as Rob. It was awesome having you uh, share some of your insights with us. Um, it really means a lot to us that our, uh, so many of our, our partners are attending these things. Um, and so we're looking forward to continuing this process. You'll see some interesting subjects coming up online. Um, feel free to reach out to, to Rachel and myself. Um, and as always, a, a big special thank you to family, Gina, Rachel. There's a lot of plug and players behind the scenes that are keeping this thing moving forward for everybody. So, you know, it's wonderful working with all of you. And, you know, we're blessed to have such a good team uh, keeping, keeping the lights on over here at Plug and Play. So. See everybody next week.